So before she sits down, I'll introduce ourselves now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Hi, Anita. So my name is Russell. This is Anita, Russell Wolf. I actually grew up 30 kilometers straight west of Penhold. We farmed there for a lifetime till 2014 when God started tugging on our hearts that he wanted more out of us than just farming. And um, it's been a process. We don't have time today to hear our testimony, um, but as you can tell from our age, we're not necessarily the youngest ones that have entered the mission field. We've been in it for one year, but we also say that we are slow learners. It took God a long time to mold us into what he wanted for the role that we are in today. So um, I know we have about 45 minutes, so I'm going to give a little bit of a message which fits right into the children's message, as well as it starts in Acts. <laughs> um, and then um, we want to share a little bit about the work that our team is doing. We're not going to share a whole bunch about what we as individuals do, because it takes a team to do the work. And we're a part of that team. Um, Anita and I manage the um, compounds, the work that we are doing there. Um, that's why God took so long for us to learn administration skills and stuff, and that's what the organization needed in South Sudan. So outs outside of what you'll see in our presentation, I'm just going to say that we also manage. Anita's a personnel manager, and I'm the assets and operations manager as well as sharing the gospel. So then we'll leave it with that. Um, Anita is, we, we wanted to give you a little bit about what church looks like in Doro, South Sudan. Recognize that it's, we're, we're in an area where there's 150,000 refugees from um, the Blue Nile area. So there's numerous churches. So we're just going to give you a little bit. And so this is how Anita would go to church. This is how I would go to church. We would change that all the ladies please sit over here, all the men please sit over here. And the children at the very back. And the children at the very back. And We'll have um, the potluck about 2.30. Oh. <laughs> so that, that's a, that, that is. Our, the worship service starts at 8 and finishes about noon. And today if I start speaking and I stop for a minute, it's because I'm looking for a translator that I don't need today. Because as Anita says, we're speaking and we're learning Arabic, but the one church we attend speak Maban, the other one speaks Uduk, another one speaks Jimjim. So there's, there's all the tribal languages that the churches actually speak. So Arabic is kind of the over-encompassing language that they somewhat know. So with that, I think I will share a little bit of a message with you, and then we will share what um, we are doing in South Sudan and how God is working in South Sudan. Really, it's not us doing it. It is what God is doing in South Sudan. Um, let's just begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for these people in this church, Lord, for their heart to serve you, Heavenly Father. Um, it's just exciting. Please let my words be your words, Heavenly Father, and that their hearts are opened and they can find their place in the movement, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I titled my short message, um, Be Part of the Movement. In today's world, we know there's so many movements, right? And I'm not even going to get into the titles of them all, but I'm going to tell you about majority of them are, they concentrate in one thing. What is in it for me? What is best for me? Um, and so even, there's even groups that are changing the scripture. They're changing God's word. It's not God inspiring it. We know that. But there's movements to change God's word so that it feels good. So it, so it adjusts the Bible to how they want it to be. Um, it's called progressive Christianity. If you haven't looked, heard about it, look into it. It's really scary. Um, we know that when they do that, that's not God's work. Today, 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 the movement that I am talking about is one that you're not going to hear it in the media very often. It's not very sexy. It's hard work. It takes sacrifice. It takes time. But my, is it rewarding. And it is the Great Commission. So I am going to just read from you Acts um, chapter 1, 7 and 8 to start with. The Great Commission, Acts, Jesus shares the Great Commission five times in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And these are some of his final words before he ascends. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I usually combine Acts with Matthew, Great Commission. And I'll explain why briefly in a moment. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a lot packed into those two scriptures in the movement that I'm asking you to be a part of, and I'm sh sure majority of our part of. Um, first, in Acts, he tells us to be a witness. Witness isn't just your mouth. It's how you act. And that has become so evident with Anita and I in South Sudan. The people watch how you act, how you respond to adversity, conflict. You don't think we have conflict there? We have conflict. That we address it in the gracious manner when it happens. Um, in Matthew, he's telling us to make disciples. He's very direct that he wants us not just to be witnesses, but to make disciples. And the last line in Matthew that we all must remember as we move forward is, he is with us always, wherever we go. So yes, the Great Commission. The Barnaba Group is a group in the United States that does surveys of the Christian church throughout the United States. 2018, they did a survey asking churchgoers, regular churchgoers, so you and I, if you walk in another church, if you know what the Great Commission is. 51% of them did not know what the Great Commission was. That's people walking in this church every Sunday. Not this church, but a church. 25% had heard of it, but uh, I'm not quite sure what it is. 17% knew what it was, and 6 were just unsure. How can God's kingdom grow the way God wants it to grow if 70 plus percent of people that call themselves Christians going to church don't even understand the Great Commission, what we are called to do. And the Great Commission, many people, I mean, a couple um, falsehoods about the Great Commission, many say, well, the Great Commission are for people like Anita and I or any of the other missionaries that go abroad. No, that is incorrect. It's right outside the door of the mission field. It's for our supporters that are supporting us financially. They're part of the We take them to South Sudan. I read an article while I was preparing for this. The title just glared out to me. Why is the Great Commission so controversial? And I'm thinking, why is there controversy in the Great Commission? And the article went on to read that the Great Commission in today's world is all about economic gain and political change. That is sad. That is what people are looking at out there. We know different. The Great Commission is about one thing and one thing only, bringing people to Christ and teaching people to bring people to Christ. So I'm just going to briefly go through a few examples in the scripture of how we can join the movement. Because I'm sure many of us have said, I'm not qualified, I don't know Arabic, I'm not going to go overseas, or I don't know how to speak in front of people, as Anita said right here. Ten years ago, if I told someone I was speaking in front of people, given the message, I would have said, no, absolutely not. Anything is possible with God. And you don't know your limitations. God knows them, and they're, they're going to be big and strong. Just let God take. So we're going to look at five different things. First, we're going to just quickly read um, from Jeremiah 1.5. Because many people think, God doesn't have a plan for me. Little old me from central Alberta, from Penhold, or wherever you might live. But in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew who you were born. I, be, sorry, I will try that again. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to all nations. Yes, he's speaking to Jeremiah, but he's speaking to each of you too. He knew who you were before you were born. He knew who you were before the earth was created. He had a plan for you at this specific time in his great plan. And then if we look at Jeremiah 29, 11, 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I could go on and on with scriptures that say that God has a plan for you. We just have to listen. We just have to discern what is God telling us. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. What is your purpose in God's plan? Have you thought about it? Next, I just want to talk about the disciples briefly. If we got into great detail on the disciples, we would be here until 2.30, 3 o'clock. Um, but the way and who Jesus chose as his disciples spoke a lot to the people in the Bible, in the Bible times, Jesus' time, but it speaks to us today as well. Because they were a diverse group of people. There were fishermen. Fishermen in that time were considered hard workers, you know, your average um, blue-collar, hard-working people. There was a tax collector. Tax collector by many were called criminals. Not trusted. There was one born of noble descent, of royalty. There was a nationalist. Do we know any nationalists today? There was a nationalist who had a great hatred for Rome. Here's a man who Jesus called to be a disciple, and he hated Rome. Jesus changed his heart. By Jesus selecting such a variety of individuals to be those first 12 disciples, tells you and I that no matter what our background is, we are and can be disciples of Jesus. In Luke chapter 8, 26 to 39, we read about a man who was demon-possessed. He walked around town naked, slept in the tombs because the demons had possessed him. He, Jesus come to his town and he pleaded to Jesus, free me of these. Jesus did. I'm not going to go in that, the story there that much. The demons asked to go into the pigs, went into the pigs, pigs ran and drowned themselves. Really cool. Shows God's awesome power. But I want to concentrate on it's the last part of it. In verses 38 and 39, when we read in Luke, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him, Jesus, earnestly to be with him. The man wanted to go with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away and said, go back to your home and tell all of what God has done for you. And he went off proclaiming throughout the town how much Jesus has done for him. I think this is very interesting, a very awesome example of how we are all called to be different in Jesus' world. Called the disciples to follow him. Yet here was a man who wanted to follow him, and Jesus says, no, don't come with me. Your calling is there in your own town. So if you think that you cannot be a disciple of Jesus, part of his greater plan, here is a man who walked around town naked, slept in tombs and was a G disciple of Jesus, went to town and said, look what Jesus has done for me. Do we go out and say, look what Jesus has done for me? Another example, and I love this story. John chapter 4, 1 to 30. We all know this story. The woman at the well. Jesus had been traveling a long time, comes to the town, in Samaria, and he sits down at the well because his human side shows he's tired, he's thirsty, needs a rest. This woman comes up, wants to draw water from the well. Jesus strikes up a conversation. I would have loved to have been a fly hanging around on that water well, listening to what Jesus and them talked about because we don't hear the whole conversation. We just hear Jesus saying and recognizing that the lady, when that was, she, she was honest, I don't have one husband. I'm not even living with my husband, but I have five other husbands. Jesus says, you are right. And she was a Samaritan woman. A Samaritan woman in those days was considered unclean, away. The Jews did not want those people. But yet Jesus is telling us right here, doesn't matter what your race is, where you're from, what your people group is, you're part of his great plan. And at the end of the story, what did the lady do? went to the town and said, come, come with me. See what Jesus has done. Do we do that? 
not just on Sunday, but every week? Do we go to people and say, come, see what Jesus has done? Still wondering if God has a plan for you? Let's look at Paul. Paul, the, what I consider, and that's this is my only personal, everyone will have, I think the greatest apostle. I learned so much from Paul and his letters. But he started out Saul, and what did Saul do? Saul was the one who was part of the first martyr, Stephen. And then, if we read in Acts, in Acts chap, chapter 8, verse 3, Saul, Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would go from house to house, dragging women and men out of their homes, and putting them in prison because they following Christ. So here's a man. Can you think of a man, anyone who's more against Christianity? But yet what did Jesus do? God changed his heart, and he became a disciple. In chapter 9, we see the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and started to grow because Saul, become Paul, spoke great of Jesus and what Jesus has done. And it put peace amongst the church as it grew. God had planned for a man like Paul, the great persecutor of the early church. And he also has a plan for you. What is your part of the movement? And now I want to quickly share with you one more story about a man in the Bible. Barnabas. In Acts 4, 36 37. We're in Acts quite a bit today. <laughs> um, so Barnabas, his name translated means son of encouragement. So many of us think, well, you know, and, and I always stand up and say, God didn't call us all to be preachers, missionaries, because if we did, there'd be no one to talk to, no one in the pew. Um, so we all have our call. And sometimes it isn't to go as well. Sometimes it's to be a person of encouragement. And how do we encourage? When, you, when people encourage Anita and I, you are part of the great movement. You are part of the great commission. We take you with us. When we say we in South Sudan, we're not talking about Nina and I. We're talking about our support team. We're talking about everyone who's praying for us. You are with us. So what is the first encouragement that Barnabas does? Joseph, a Levite from Cy Cyprus by birth. We're reading from Acts 4, 36 to 37. The Sorry. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, by birth, the one of the apostle Barnabas sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is one of the first examples, as the church grew, of people supporting the growth of the church. Barnabas was, gave the money to them. When God provides a need and I financial support from people we don't even know, it is great encouragement. I can remember one time, I don't know, two or three months ago, Nate and I were in, sitting south down, a little bit down. Trust me, not every day is roses and sunshine when you're a missionary. Um, we're down, and here we get an email. Person we don't even know has come on to support us monthly. Never met them. That's God working. That's not Russell and Nita working. Absolutely not. How else did Barnabas encourage? In Acts 26 and 27, we see the disciples afraid of Saul, soon to be Paul, for good reason. <laughs> this is a guy who had been terrorizing the church. They were scared. But what did Barnabas, Barnabas do? He took Paul to the disciples and said, this guy's good. He's saying good things. He was an encourager. That's what he did. He trusted Paul. He trusted God that Paul had changed. And he encouraged the disciples. Trust this man. Trusting and believing is huge encouragement. We would never be where we are today if we didn't have family members and people that trusted us when we said, we're going to move to South Sudan. They could have said, where's the padded room? But no, they 
trusted us and they encouraged us. In Acts 11, 22 to 24, we see Barnabas encouraging the early church, the people to remain true, true to the Lord, true to God's word. And that's important for our support team as well, to encourage us that way, to make sure that Anita and I, and any missionaries, I'm just speaking to Anita and I here, but any missionaries, to stay true to God's word. It is vital. It is vital for us to do that. Like I say, it's not always easy. It's not always roses and sunshine. So how do we know what our plan is and God's great plan? Through building that relationship with Christ. Through communication with Christ. Through discernment. For some people like Paul, he speaks real loud. We read in the Bible. It was a thundering voice. I can just imagine. Somebody like me, he whispers. If I don't stop and sit down, I don't hear God because I'm too busy. And he, and, he, and he knows me. He needs me to stop and listen. And I know there's many other ways that God communicates with us. Communicates with us through other people. But there's two key ways of communicating with God. First is prayer. That is our communication to him. And God's communication to us is here. That's the two-way communication. And once you have that two-way communication, then you can start discerning where God wants you. And it changes. There's a season. I know everyone likes seasons. I like chapters. I like chapters. Every, there's different chapters in your life all the time. Um, and so you've got to continue. You, Anita and I can't just say, oh, God's called us to South Sudan. That's where we're going to sit. We don't know what the next plan is. The church where I was at, I always asked my pastor where Russell's daytimer was in the Bible, and it's just not there. You've got to pray. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to discern where God wants you tomorrow. I want to tell you, and it's got to be focused communication. I just want to tell you a real quick story of a lady in South Sudan. I've never met her. I heard the story. Um, but she has a dedicated time, this lady, and, um, every day to be in prayer with her God, with our Heavenly Father. The one evening, I think it's about five, I think we were told she prays somewhere in there, just before dark, um, sun sets at six. So it must have been just after dark. So six, she's praying. She's in her 15 minutes, half hour prayer with God. She hears thieves outside her hut. What do you think she did? Did she go up outside to see what was happening? No. She continued to pray. Didn't matter what was happening outside. This was my focused time with God. And we all can learn from that lady. That it doesn't matter what is happening around us. We have that focused time with our Heavenly Father. And that's how we will know where our plan is on this day in God's great plan for us. And for His kingdom. And you know, what they stole was her water drum. And so the water drum would be like somebody cutting off the water to your hot, or your homes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> ooh, reverted back to South Sudan there. They haul water there, and that's where they store the water for the next day. So they took her source of water. God rewarded her for her faithfulness. Two days later, her water tub was found two huts down. So stay focused. And, I, and when I say, say focused, I need to be looking in the mirror all the time because anybody who knows me well, I'm everywhere. And um, I need to take that time to be focused. Wake up every morning. Prior, prior, we learned this from um, CMA. We're also part of the Christian Motorcycle Association, kind of quiet members right now. But um, they encourage us, and part of our training is to wake up every morning. When you say your prayers... Also pray for people to come into your lives to share the gospel. People who need to hear the gospel. If we all did that, where would God's kingdom be? It would be growing. And remember, as I said at the start, this isn't easy. This walk, joining this movement, is not done by sight. It's done by faith. And we read that in 2 Corinthians 5, 5 7. <coughs> So 
So why should we join the movement? Joining the movement doesn't get us to heaven. We know that. It's through the blood of Christ on the cross. And that is something, actually, if we really talk, that's something that we've really got to instill in South Sudan because of their culture. They still believe its works can take them. So that's something we talk about all the time. So why? If we're already saved by Jesus on that cross, why join the movement? Why not just sit in our house? Because of what Christ did for us. That's why we join the movement. And then... And because of time, I'm not going to read the Bible. We've all heard it. In Matthew 22, 37 to 39, love your neighbor as yourself. What is the greatest love that you can show your neighbor? And remember, if we read in the scripture, neighbor isn't necessarily the person sitting beside you. It's everybody. What is the greatest love that you can show your neighbor? Especially a neighbor who doesn't know Christ. Tell them about Christ. That's why we join the movement. And it's scary. I, 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 was, I was telling Pastor Dave here when I was telling him what I was speaking about that <clears throat> I feel Anita and I, we're cowards. We run over to South Sudan where no one knows us. The hard mission field is right outside this door. I hope this message and throughout our presentation that's coming up just encourages you um, just to join the movement, to share God's love. Whether it's through physically things, through supporting missionaries. Um, yes, I'm not lying. Nate and I are here. We're looking for support as well. It continues to take money to, to, to do the work, and you're going to see the work that we're doing. Um, through prayer, we would not be here if we did not have a strong prayer support team. We have a um, sign-up sheet at the back. If you want to hear, receive our monthly prayer letter, we would love to send it to you. It's not long. Trust me, it's about a page, page and a half every time. But it shares what we are doing and where we need prayer. And also how we can pray for you, we ask that question. When you are looking at where you fit in God's plans, don't look at me. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at Pastor Dave. God created each of us differently. Your role, your purpose and his plan is specific for you. Go back to the start. If we all pastors, there'd be no one in the seats to be talking to. So don't judge how you are in God's plan by what other people are doing. There's only one person that you have to be accountable to when you're a part of God's plan, and that's our Heavenly Father. So join the movement. Let's join the movement and be part of God's kingdom and help it grow. Amen. So Neat and I will now would love to just share with you some pictures and what the work we are doing with in South Sudan and briefly who Sim is as well. So and we will try to click through and as Anita said, she doesn't like to talk. Um, I don't know, I would argue with that after 36 years of marriage, but um, um, we will start with a little bit of who SIM is. Not everybody knows who serving and mission is SIM. Um, and I would actually encourage you to go to the website to see more, www.sim.ca. But it is a non-denominational organization that believes the Bible is God's word. Inspired. Our salvation is um, a gift from God through the blood of Jesus Christ. The organization is working in over 70 countries right now with over 4,500 workers. And this is the one thing that attracted the next point, 129 years old. It was founded in 1893 by three individuals, two Canadians and one American. For an organization to stay that long, that means they've stayed sound to the word and they've been able to adapt to the change of the world by staying sound in the word. Next slide. Do you want to say something? <laughs> Go. Um, <laughs> yeah, what do we do? We share uh, God's love. We witness to Christ's love uh, where he's least known. And that is that you're going to hear some of the physical stuff we do, but we have to. So when, when we hit the water project, you'll hear see with our water project or a medical clinic, the first thing we answer is how are we witnessing? That's a question we got to answer first before we do any of the hands-on stuff. 
Next slide. So Sudan, South Sudan is the newest country, I think still the newest country on, on the planet, 2011. Um, so I don't have a pointer, but you see Sudan, Egypt, Sudan, and then that's red. Yeah. <laughs> Colorblind. Um, so Sudan underneath. So that is the country we're at. And then if you switch over, there's the country of South Sudan with its 10 current states. And we're in the upper Nile region. So if you look back at the map, we we're right in actually South Sudan, Ethiopia, very, very close or very close to Sudan and Ethiopia. Right in that little peak that you see <clears throat> goes on the right hand side where it goes up, we're right in that corner of South Sudan. So we're very close to the, like Russell said, to the Sud Sudan, South Sudan border, and also very close to the Ethiopian border as well in that. Okay, next slide. And then if we break down um, the county, or the, the state into the county, we're in the Maban County. And this is just a shot um, from Google Maps. Um, that pond of water, our, our compounds are just on the side of the water. So that water isn't there year round, that is just during rainy season that water comes in. So that gives you a real quick rough idea where we live on this planet right now. Next slide. So we have a medical clinic. Um, this was part of the start of SIM there. This medical clinic, it sees between 3,500 and 4,500 patients a month. And this bottom slide, you see the man standing there? Those are all the patients waiting in the morning. Captive audience, they want to see a doctor. Guess what they're hearing? <laughs> They're hearing how Jesus loves them. Yeah. And there is incredible stories come out of that clinic. I had the opportunity, actually, it was probably only a month into our stay, went over to meet our chaplains. That's probably one of the chaplains, I can't tell from his back. And the first thing I got to do was pray with a lady who a month earlier was a witch doctor. And Satan still had a hold of her with alcohol. And we prayed. And she didn't understand a word I said. But yet the Holy Spirit moved and we were all in tears by the end of that. There at the bottom you see the team. Um, that's a leprosy clinic. We actually have the only leprosy clinic in that state. And so there our staff members are praying with an individual with leprosy. So it's the top picture are two doctors. Dr. Cornelia, who is from Switzerland. And Dr. Dixon, who is um, Kenyan. Our team, I should, before I go on too, our team is very diverse from where we come from. New Zealand, Canada, U.S., uh, India, uh, Switzerland, Kenya. U.S. Uh, yeah, I said U.S. Um, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Did I get them all now? Yeah, we have s <laughs> somebody coming from Bolivia in the next, two, next 12 months, so um, and it's really cool. And actually, what I really love about that is it just gives you a little picture of what heaven is going to be like to have no, we're, we're all united in Christ and there's no Ethiopians, there's no Canadians, there's no Americans, there's no Kenyans. We're just all children of the same Heavenly Father. And it's so awesome to have the opportunity to work with so many different people from all different backgrounds. And despite the fact we're all different, we're all the same because of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Next slide. Just some more pictures of um, the clinic. And the bottom right hand picture is actually our maternity clinic. Now, because of lack of funding and lack of staff, we uh, only have a Monday to Friday service and it's prenatal, postnatal, and um, nutrition with newborns because there's a lot of malnutrition in our area. So um, the man, Justice that's there uh, is working with, um, like I said, pre and postnatal um, care of people. So we used to, I, at one time when they first started, they actually used to be able to deliver babies there. We have all the equipment there, but we don't have the staff and we don't have the money to run the clinic full time, 24 seven, so. Okay, next slide. So this is our second physical discipleshipping that we do is the water project. 
as you know, and I'm not going to repeat what all of you know, clean water is essential to living, and it is what these people so much desire. So, um, the folks in Palm Key, I have to, I have to say this, the people in Palm Key, they had to walk for, was it two hours, two three hours. hours? These pictures are in Palm Key. These are Palm Key, yes, the water well that was drilled in Palm Key. Before this, they've been waiting for years for fresh water. They requested uh, help with drilling a well. Two hours to fresh water. Not, not fresh, not fresh water. water, water. Not fresh water. Mud. Mud. Mud water. Yeah. They so would bring back in. That's the only access they have. So we drilled this borehole. Uh, when, we, when we have funds, we will work with organizations. The, that's the drill machine there. It's the coolest machine I've ever seen. Um, that Palm K is another whole story in its own, but um, we had to drill through 50 meter of rock to get water. The rock started at 20 meters, and it was one rock. It wasn't gravel that come out. It was one rock that we had to drill through, and that machine drilled through it by the grace of God. And what's the really, I gotta tell you, you might be here to tell too. <laughs> The drilling truck was drilling, 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 and normally a lot of the wells in our area are only, what, 20, 20 meters, 20, 20 25 meters. meters. So when you, you're already down to 50, you're beginning to wonder, did we hear you wrong, God, that we were in the wrong place? Like, why, why are we not reaching water? And we continue to pray. We sent out the, the message to all our supporters and all the teams sent out messages, pray, pray, pray. This community needs water. They've been praying and crying out to God for water. And when we got to a point where we were thinking, do we continue? Do we not continue? What do we do, Lord? Russell and, and our driller felt a definite call from God saying, keep drilling, keep drilling. It, it's going to happen. And I didn't until the praying happened. Yeah. That decision landed on me, whether we keep drilling or not. Or whether we just give up. And, and, say, and it was through the prayers, the prayers of a whole bunch of people that, and a very faithful driller that encouraged me. And you know what? That driller's Muslim. And, and through him, he said, no, we keep drilling. So and always opportunity. So the, short of it, respect your time. We hit water. We look for funding to drill other boreholes. Um... This pump, that pump, that's okay. You don't have to go back. Or oh, that pump now is pumping 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People are queuing up. Yeah. So the other thing that we do, which is actually more, I won't, not more important because you can't put weight on clean water, but we repair boreholes. If just sometime go into, and I can't remember the figures, Google how many boreholes in Africa are not operating. It's a bigger need than drilling. And so we actually go and repair the boreholes. Quite often it's a cylinder. Uh, I've had the, I'm gonna say the blessing because that's how God hooked me, telling one village that we could not repair their borehole. Um, so they are without water um, until we can get funding to drill. But repairing the boreholes are um, just key as well. So that's another. And when we do that, so we talked about the praying there. And I, 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 I should, I apologize, it did not show. We start with prayer and worship before we start working on the borehole. Our, our couple of our men are great singers. They start singing and then we pray and then we repair the borehole or drill. Next. Celebrating the gift of God's water. It was a huge celebration when we hit water and they invited us there. I had the opportunity to share God's love to thousand people. The, the people come from everywhere there because this was the water for them. And then the dancing. Um, good thing I didn't because I hear the struggle. We could have put a video up here of Anita dancing with the people. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, but no, I, just, imp just important, the partnership. Um, the gentleman on the right with the sash is one of the village leaders. He's a sheikh in charge. And... You know, they're the ones who influence. And I'll wait until we get to the next slide. I just about jumped too far. Next slide. Places of worship. 
Don't forget Palm K though, because it comes into play here in a few slides. Different, different places of worship. The center one is the church um, closest to us. It's the one that if I'm not asked to go elsewhere, this is where we attend and worship. Um, it is actually the first SIM planted church in the area, SIM planted church in the area. Um, the, the one with the roof being built, there again, that's Palm K. They started building the church with us there and a church is being built there. And the other one is in the um, refugee, ref, refugee village. Um, it's the Uduk church. That church, when I preached there, I was sitting there preaching, or no, getting ready to preach. And just like here, the kids go off to service. I'm going, There's going to be no one left here. There was 700 people at the service. 400 of them were children. Yeah. And they have an amazing uh, Sunday school yeah, program, this, so it's very exciting. And this is where God, like, and this is a cool thing too. God has called Anita and I more to the established churches, to work with them, to grow them. Um, we have missionaries who go out, do the church planning, they're meeting with the small ones. That's why we want to share what the team as a whole is doing because it's not one person, it's not two people, it's the whole team. Next slide. Equipping the church. So that is what we do too. And the church, understand, they, have, they, they are learning how to be a, a missional church. They are a long ways yet from it to where I believe God would like it to be, but it's a learning thing. You only know what you know. So in these pictures... Um, top is a men's Bible study I lead. Mind you, we've had some women come, which is awesome because that is, that is crossing cultural boundaries when men and women are studying the Bible together. And that is awesome to see because God doesn't say men, women, but study together. Um, preaching at the, the brick church. And then the bottom is many of the pastors in the area. And we were just having a meeting um, of what a partnership with SIM and the local churches look like. What do they need? And it was anywhere from equipping Sunday school teachers to money management and everything in between. And they need it all. So it was just learning how, because the, we, we're there to work ourselves out of a job. We would love to go away and the church has this. And so that, that is our goal. Next slide. Sunday school teachers. This is actually we, um, our teammate Violanti, who is from India, uh, has been teaching, leading all the pastors of the area, uh, trying to encourage them to begin uh, a church program, Sunday school, what we what we would call Sunday school for the children of the churches. Uh, normally what happens, at least uh, in everything but we've seen in the Uduk church, the kids would just go outside and play during church. Or maybe they would have someone teach them a few songs, but they weren't actually teaching them about Jesus or Bible stories or just, they just had no program whatsoever to encourage uh, children's uh, Christian growth. So uh, this is me on the right hand side because we, uh, we had a workshop teaching uh, people how to be a teacher, how to be that Sunday school teacher that encourages the kids, how to use their Bible. Because sometimes people go in from the West and we go in and we bring all these fancy VBS programs and we bring all this Sunday school curriculum and realistically, most of those kids can't read or write. Most of the teachers can't read or write. They don't have the money to buy fancy program, you know, and build fancy sets and puppets and different things. They have the Word of God just yet. So what we've done is we're teaching them how to create a Sunday school program just from the Bible. Nothing fancy, just God's truth. And the cool thing with this was the church come to us. And that's what we want. We want the church coming to us asking for this instruction. And the other thing I told you not to forget about Palm K. Palm K, from where we live, so where this training took place to where Palm K is, is 70 kilometers away or about two and a half hour drive. 
They had one person come from there, drove on a motorcycle through the bush of South Sudan to learn through our connection with that borehole drilling. That was exciting. So my family will, that's here will we'll get a real kick out of this because I have a lot of musical cousins, a lot of talented musicians and singers. I am not blessed with singing or musical ability. And here I am in the bottom right hand corner. Leading an action song. Leading <laughs> an action song in English. So. So, very cool. Next slide. God's word. I just wanted to just, this is, these pictures just touched me. So the, the we're going to start your left. Um, that's at a church service. And the man, not in the blue shirt, but the other one, just got his first Bible. And I can't express the joy that he had as his friend beside him started sharing how to lose a Bible and stuff. And the, that's Maban. And the Maban are some of the fortunate ones. It's translated in their language um, in both Old and New Testament. The Uduk is just New Testament. There's translators working. There's 19 different languages in our area. Um, yeah. The ne Well, I got, sorry, this is, yeah. I, quick, honestly, quick, I don't speak in public yet. Um, <laughs> one, one thing that really, really became very apparent to me was when we started atten attending our, near our church, what we consider our home church in Dora, South Sudan, I sat and because we don't speak Maban, and we, we still don't speak Arabic that well, to sit in a church where I could not understand the word of God being read, I could not understand the words of the songs, I could not understand the people next to me, and I real it struck me to be able to hear and read the Bible, God's word in your own heart language even just to come back, it, I'm here, and this is the first church we've attended since coming home because we've only been here a few days now. And here singing and, and the word of God in my heart language, which is English, it's astounding. So you can imagine, I just, it, the translations are so important to be able to read God's word in your own language. So the, the middle picture is actually one of our guards. We have guards in our compounds, and he's just sitting reading his Bible in the day. Well, that's a quiet time. And on the, the last one is baptism. That, was, that particular service, I think there were seven or eight baptized. But we heard of a, a church out in the bush. Um, five or seven pastors went out. In one day, they baptized 240 people. With that, that's exciting. But the next step is... We have to follow up. The church has to know how to follow up with those people. Um, they need to understand that just being baptized, that's not the end. And so that's, that is what we are doing when we're equipping the church. Next slide. So these are just pictures of a women's Bible study that I attended. Our, um, on the right, picture on the right-hand side, the lady in the orange and red tobe, which is the name for the full garb that goes from top to bottom. Uh, that's BU, and she actually holds a Bible study with the June June women in uh, one of the refugee villages every week. So she goes in, she's an evangelist uh, extraordinaire. God's really gifted her to be able to, to connect with the women in these villages, and she holds a Bible study. So, and, it, and it is a relationship. So that's why Anita goes in. Like in a year, we've just started building the relationships. We've just started getting the trust where people will come to us. And so by Anita going in, that's building that relationship so that the next step will come. Next slide. Just about done, I promise. I smell the food. Um, air travel. We are isolated. We have to fly in and out. Um, many of our supplies come in and out by plane. Any, I shouldn't say any construction, any specialty construction, so any um, plumbing, electrical supplies, that kind of stuff has to be flown in. We cannot get it there. So we come in on a caravan. The picture actually on the right is our first steps on the ground in Doral. 
Um, part of our responsibility as well, that's, I know you can't tell the pitch is pretty small in the middle, that's actually me fueling the plane. Um, where we're, so that is a charter flight. AIM is the organization that we charter. African Inland. Yeah, yeah someone yeah, said it. <laughs> yeah. I never get it. We have come so much appreciate them because without them, we couldn't do our work. And that's the airport that an Eden B were sitting at having yeah. a tea. <laughs> the tea is really delicious. Uh, ask me later. Um, Next slide. Just some travel in the bush when we go out to repair borehills and stuff. When I said 70 kilometers, two and a half hours, this is why. And many of the areas, um, well, we do not have phone coverage. We carry a satellite phone. That is our. Uh, the village of Pumpkey, where the borehole was drilled, cannot be reached during the rainy season by vehicle. Next, next slide. And people just, just ask about our home. And I guess who wants to talk about our home? So <laughs> the middle is our home. That is where we live. Um, and that is our home. People, someone asked where we're living today. That that's our home. We're visiting. That's home right now. Um, it's two four by four meter rooms and a and a veranda, veranda kitchen area. The showers on the um, it's a that side. Is that the left side, girls? Yep. Yeah. And then our toilet. Just put that up real close. People ask us how we live. Our water um, currently comes by donkey cart, and then it's we filter to drinking. Um, we come at such a great time. The Lord had blessed this organization. We got funding to drill boreholes on each of our compounds. So we've drilled the boreholes. And when, when I get back into Doro in October, we will have our own water on our compounds. We will complete it. So and that, that is huge for the missionaries thriving, um, as well as our security. Because in 2016, there was fighting and the missionaries had to lock down for three days, they run out of water. And so by having our own boreholes, that is also a security measure. So it is such a blessing that people are willing to give for that. So just wanted to quickly show you our home. I don't want to go in a bunch of details because it's not about us. Yeah. It's about what God is doing. But this is one of the questions where we live. So that is where we live. And, and the other thing, there are no big animals. Um, because the trees have been harvested for charcoal. So there, we, what we see is snakes, rats, bats, and scorpions. Um, we have a cat that's adopted us. We killed, in three days, we killed 10 scorpions in our house um, one time. Um, we've killed, I, have, I actually have killed one snake, but it's like a fishing story. I didn't send the picture home to my kids because it was only a small one. If it would have been a big one, I would have sent it home. Look what your dad did. But we have, we, I don't know, once a week, twice a week, their snakes are killed, and they're poisonous snakes. We actually, the one snake that we've killed twice is a puff adder. It is um, responsible for the most snake deaths on in Africa. Um, the nice thing is it's nice and slow. We keep our compounds looking like this, so we see them. The reason that it's responsible for most deaths is because of the farmers out in the bush preparing their land, and they step on this puff adder. You've got less than an hour to get anti-venom, or you're dead with that guy. So. Yeah, um, when we moved into our house, in the first week, we evicted 25 bats. <laughs> um, so, but that's one of the things that I actually brought into because some of you know I'm doing rentals and stuff. We are actually, our house is now 80%, 85% sealed from the outside roads. And we're trying different things because that's what helps the missionaries thrive. That's what helps them do their job if they're not worried about what's flying over. Or like one night having a bat inside your mosquito net instead on the outside. She slept through it. I woke up in the morning and said, you know, I kicked a bat out of the net. So next slide. Just God's beauty. It is a beautiful country. And I describe it very much like where we live here. They have natural resources. They have rich agricultural land. They don't have winter, but they have a dry season. And they can do it. It, it. it is so similar. Like, if you don't think God has a plan for you, ask me. He's taken a person from here, persons from here, and put us almost in a similar kind of area across the globe. 
Um, and it's just for us to go. So he's got a plan for you because, like I guess, even four years ago, if you said we'd be up here talking to you about this, no. So no matter what your age, whether you're this high, this high, as long as you've got breath in your body, you are part of great, God's great plan. You are part of the movement. I think the next slide is thank you. Yeah. Um, For they give us the book. Yeah. Thank you so much. I apologize. I think we went over a little bit. I apologize. Sorry, we get passionate. I kept trying to look at the time. We are so grateful for having you have us here. Um, at the back, we have um, little prayer cards. tells you who we are, um, how, to contact. how to contact us, how to um, donate to us, to our work, if you want. Um, if God puts it on your heart, um, we would love to have you part of our team, prayer, financially, whatever. We just love you to be part of our team. Um, thank you again and again. Just a reminder too, if you want our week, our mon monthly. If I said weekly, she that might be the divorce. <laughs> um, yeah. No, uh, the monthly prayer letter. Um, yeah, just sign up. It's just an email. It comes once a month. We try to. So thank you. With that, can I or did you have some? Okay. Okay. Thanks so much for sharing with us yeah. today. I hadn't even noticed that you've gone over <laughs> oh, good. it. I'm sure we, we probably could sit and listen for another hour of the, the interesting things. But it's great to hear you know, your, your love for God's word and your, your desire to share that with the people. Uh, I think we can resonate with that a little bit. We, we love hearing that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, exciting to see what God is doing through you guys and your steps of obedience and your challenge for us to do likewise. We really appreciate that for sure. Okay. So let me, let me pray for you guys and, and for us. And just a reminder again, please stay for our potluck. I'll, I'll, I'll pray for that here in just a little bit afterwards once the ladies get that all organized but yeah let's let's pray together dear god we thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to, to get a little glimpse of what you're doing on, on the other side of the planet we get so secluded and wrapped up in our own little lives we kind of forget that there's a whole another world out there and you are busy doing all kinds of great and wonderful things and you use uh, all kinds of people to do it we thank you for using uh russell and, and anita for bringing them over there and, and using them in some incredible ways. Uh, and we thank you for the challenge that we have here as well, God. Uh, you've got a plans for us as well. You want to use us maybe over there, but maybe right here or wherever you have. Uh, so I pray that we'd be obedient to your, your little whispers or your thunderous voice or whatever it is that you use to communicate to us and that we'd be obedient to your voice. Thanks again for all these uh, these little uh, reminders uh, of what you've said in your word, your promises, your, the examples that we have of others who have uh, faithfully been obedient to you. We pray that we would uh, carry on those footsteps as well. So we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you.